Welcome to Gorima. My name is Alexander Reit. Today I will show you how our hand milling machines, the SMAs, generally work. First, let's take a look at the assembly of the machines. There are two different kinds of drives, one with a 110 volt or 230 volt electrical connection and a six bar compressed air connection for pneumatic motors. The power is transferred from the motor to an angular gear and from there to our booster technology which increases the efficiency of the milling process and reduces vibrations. Then comes the milling head holder, the milling head itself and then the carbide cutting inserts. The milling process is guided by two components. The first is the guiding plate which rests on the sheet surface. The other one is the guiding roller which copies the contour of the outer edges. This enables me to use the machine for processing straight edges as well as contours. All machines have a spindle locking function to change the milling head or the cutting inserts. On the electrical machines, it's activated by a button on the back of the angular gear. And on the pneumatic machines, it's done using bolts on the underside. I can adjust the height of the guiding plate. One turn equals 1.5 millimeters. This allows me to flexibly adjust the chamfer height or set the height for a special radius. A nonius is attached above the guiding plate. This allows me to work very precisely. One line corresponds to 0.1 millimeters bevel height. In order to work so precisely, we always have to take an intermediate measurement and then readjust the last digits. The machines have two main areas of application. The first is beveling, which is mostly used for welding preparation or to create a beveled edge. The second main application is rounding of sharp edges with a real radius. Most of our models have exchangeable milling heads, which means that I can do both jobs using the same machine. Take, for example, a radius milling head with radius 12 millimeters, and for purposes of comparison, a 45 degree beveling head. I'll now show you how to switch from one milling head to another. To start with, we disassemble the guiding roller using a 5mm Allen key. To do that, I press the locking button on the bottom, unscrew the roller and set it aside. Then we turn the screw in the middle of the milling head counterclockwise until it no longer moves upwards. Just screw the guiding roller back in with two turns and pull both out together. The guiding roller and the milling head always fit together and it is easier to get the milling head out. We now want to install this 45 degree milling head. It has a T-plug on the underside. The length of these plug wings adapts the milling cutter to the machine. They only fit on machines that are strong enough for them. I insert the milling head so that it's aligned in the T-slot. Now we take the 5mm Allen key and turn it tight. Then we test the force of the spring-loaded spindle of our booster package, pressing the spring together two or three times. Then we assemble our guiding roller in the same way and again test the spring force of our spindle two or three times. All of our inserts are turnable and can be used in several ways. The small radius inserts with R1.2 can be used 16 times per insert. Here on the top are eight usable cutting edges and another eight on the bottom. A total of 16 cutting edges ensure an extremely long tool life. The same goes for radius 2. Inserts with radii from R2.5 to R6 can be used eight times. The K plate for beveling can also be used eight times. Chamfers with up to 8 mm chamfer width are possible. On the large machines, we use rectangular inserts with an edge length of 20 mm. These can be used four times. To change the inserts or to turn them when they are worn, I first turn the guiding plate completely down and then disassemble the guiding roller. Now the inserts are easily accessible. I just press the spindle lock with one hand and open the small screws with a 15 mm Torx wrench. Large cutting inserts have two screws per insert, or only one in each of the smaller machine inserts. 
I have four cutting edges on this insert, one on the front, one on the back, and another two on the bottom. First I turn the plate in the screw axis to use the next sharp edge. And when these two are worn out, I place the screws from the other side into the insert and assemble the unit. It works in that direction. It doesn't take a lot of force to tighten the screws, but you must make sure no screw has been forgotten, which is why I always check two times. Smaller inserts can also be used on the same milling head. This applies to normal K-plates as well as to radius K-plates. Due to the same plate height and width, they have the same plate seat. Now I can mount this K-plate on the same milling cutter or change the application completely and use other radius inserts together with a matching guiding roller. This goes for all 45 degree milling cutters. They all have a grove to make a radius up to R6. It's not possible to use radius cutting inserts with all milling heads. It only works with a basic 45 degree milling head. Let's switch to the SMA 40BER now to give you a better idea of how to set up a machine yourself and familiarize yourself with the device. Everybody needs to start with a very small bevel height to set this one and look at the guide plate and ensure that the inserts protrude approximately 2 to 3 millimeters from the guiding plate horizontally. We'll not concern ourselves with dimensional accuracy at first. All we want to do is get a feel for the machine and the process. The machine exerts forces against us during the milling process, so we need to get firm footing to guide the machine safely. The workpiece must also be securely attached, either on a welding table or a wooden table with sufficient weight. Magnetic plates or simple screw clamps are sufficient, but the workpiece must be attached to at least two points, so that it can't twist or shift while we're milling. Basically, you can mill a lot of materials with the machine, everything from copper and aluminium to normal carbon steel, tool steel, and to a limited extent also stainless steel and fine grain steel when using our models with RPM control. I put on the guide plate and slowly guide the machine to the edge of the sheet. Now we need to go back a few millimeters from the edge, start the engine. And it's very important to make sure the inserts never touch the material when I start the engine. But I should not have too much distance to the workpiece either because now I have to feel my way very slowly to the edge. The milling direction must also always be observed. The milling cutter rotates clockwise and the machine moves in the direction of synchronous milling. But we have to mill in the opposite direction so we have to continuously work against this force. As soon as we let the machine get into sink milling mode, we can no longer control the process. In the worst case, we destroy the inserts or the machine flies out of our hands. That's why it's so important to have the right working position and to penetrate the material diagonally. That means with a straight edge in this direction, I go into the material diagonally at a 45 degree angle. Due to the opposing forces generated by the milling process, we drive a short and straight starting point despite the inclined guidance that requires getting a good feel for it. That's why we're starting with this 2mm chamfer and will then gradually increase it. When guiding along an outer edge where the guiding plate can't rest on the entire surface of the material, make sure that it always lies straight. If it tilts away, the bevel angle and the bevel dimension will change. I won't destroy the workpiece by doing that, but I will have to mill over it a second time. Both the guiding roller and the guiding plate must be in contact with the material so that the dimension in between is correct. My bevel dimension is defined between the guiding plate and the guiding roller. In order to slowly increase the difficulty, we'll now turn the guiding plate one and a half turns, which amounts to almost three millimeters in chamfer height, and then we'll make another milling attempt. Same procedure, we position the guiding plate, go to the edge with the guiding roller, move back a bit and switch on the engine. We're slowly guiding the machine back into the material and now we're already getting significantly greater counterforce. As soon as the guiding roller touches the edge, we can push the machine to increase the feed. Afterwards, increase the bevel height again. Now we have a chamfer size of 7 times 45 degrees, so we now have to be more and more careful when penetrating the material, using more force for feed at the same time.
Using the SMA40, this is the maximum bevel size that can be milled in one stroke. To help you internalize the process even more, I'd now like to show you an exercise that everyone should also do before tackling the first production parts according to a drawing. In practice, we've prepared Plasma Cut S355 here. Anyone who works in this field knows how tough the plasma cut edges are after they've hardened. That also makes milling more demanding. After completing the last exercise, we still have a chamfer size of 10 millimeters or seven times 45 degrees. The hardest thing in the whole process is penetrating the material to the point where the guiding roller comes in contact with the edge. Therefore, we'll now practice this five to 10 times in a row. We turn the machine on, dive into the material at 45 degrees as before, and as soon as the roller touches the edge, we move the machine backwards. As soon as I touch the edge with the guiding roller and feel the clear guidance, I go out of the material and do this again a few centimeters further down. In order to get the maximum dimension, a width of 16 millimeters or 11 millimeters times 45 degrees, we work in three strokes. To help you start exactly at the corner, you can clamp a second workpiece with the same thickness in front of this one and from there drive into your original part. But with a little training, you can also do it without using this trick. Just two millimeters more and start again. Despite working in several strokes, the milling forces increase with the bevel width. And we actually feel this when we push the machine. Now we've managed a 16mm chamfer width in three strokes, which everyone can achieve after briefly familiarising themselves with the machine and the process. To show how to create a bevel according to a drawing, which is our next step, we can take a chamfer of 6 times 45 degrees as an example. First we set the machine's scale at about 5mm, it's 1mm less than what we want to have in the end. And then we measure the bevel height with a depth caliper and transfer the difference between this and our target height to the machine. We measure 4.8 millimeters, that means we still need 1.2 millimeters more you see, I wanted to set 5mm, but you almost never get precise results, which is why we need to check our results using a measuring device. Now we use the Nonius lines to set exactly 1.2mm more. To do this, we take an orientation point, for example this screw, and then turn 12 stitches in plus direction. And now, let's mill our bevel again. Exactly 6 times 45 degrees is not always necessary to manufacture with such precision, but now you see that you can also work very precisely using a hand milling machine. Our next job is to produce a radius R6 to an edge. I've already changed the billing head for this. We're now working with a three cutter using R6 radius inserts. Setting the radius is done using the same principle we employ to produce the precise chamfer, but here it is absolutely necessary. To do this, we first look over the surface of our guiding plate and adjust it so that the radius in the cutting inserts does not protrude completely. That means that we want to mill a bit less than we ultimately want, 
as before with the chamfer, and then correct the dimension by increasing it a bit later on. To roll to the edge a few millimeters away, I need to pull the machine towards me so as not to mid in sync. I work in my direction and also penetrate diagonally into the material so that the machine does not kick back. We can now see that the radius begins smoothly, but does not completely end up here, which means that we're not milling deep enough. Based on your own experience, you'll know quite quickly how many tenths of where you are from the full radius. Initially, it is usually less than expected. I add two tenths more, and then we compare the results. We can see that the radius is nicely rounded and I can finish milling this hole. Radius 6 like this is not necessary for painting, a radius between 2 and 4 would be enough for that, but radius 6 is ideal for cable and hose penetrations, bridges, crane sections and other workpieces with dynamic loads. As an additional example, so you can see what it looks like if I set the machine too deep, I'll readjust 0.3mm again. This can be done during the first milling attempts then you know immediately where the error is and you can correct the milling height accordingly. If you look closely, you can already see the step. Otherwise, simply slide over the top of the radius from bottom to top with your fingernail. There's a nice curve at the bottom and a step at the top. We can't bring back the material that we've now taken off. Therefore, slowly approach the measure and try it out with a test plug. This way, you can avoid rejects in production. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you could learn a bit about our hand milling machines. If you want to watch more videos like this one on SMA or other Garima products, please give the video a thumbs up. For general information, contact us by email or phone. We look forward to helping you with all your beveling needs.